So the speaker of our first talk is Professor Rene van Woudenberg, who is Professor of Epistemology and Metaphysics in the Department of Philosophy at the Free University of Amsterdam. And he joins us this morning from Amsterdam. He's also director of the Adam Kuypen Center for Science and Religion there. And Rene is gonna to speak to us this morning on the topic of science and religion, two disciplines, one reality. So Rene, welcome, and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for um, this invitation to speak through uh, this modern uh, media to you. I'm going to put up uh, a short handout um, from which I will take about 35 minutes and then there will be a time for Q&A. So as you indicated, the title of the talk is One World, Two Disciplines, Science and Religion. Now, as you all will be aware of, um, in, the, in the world abroad, very often there is a warfare advertised between science and, relig and religion. Um, now, over the, over the last decades, a lot of research has been gone of a historical nature into how actually the relationships between, the relationship between science and religion evolved uh, uh, ever since the scientific revolution in the 16th, 17th century. And it turned out to be not at all uh, uh, an, an equivocal warfare kind of picture that emerged. Uh, it was much more subtle and very often the two have lived, science and religion have lived uh, in, in, in peace with one another and they have been stimulating vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis one another. Over the last few years, there also has been a lot of interesting research about so what I call sociological research into how people in the different academic disciplines, how they identify um, world in, in a world viewish uh, perspective. Are you Christian? Are you a Muslim? Are you Buddhist? Are you, uh, are you a secularist? Or how do you self-identify? And it turns out that many people nowadays living who are working in academia, who are pursuing scientific research. Uh, it's by no means the case that most of them uh, are atheists or are anti-religious. Indeed, it's rather the contrary. Uh, way over 50% of people working uh, across the world, across disciplines, uh, they subscribe to some sort of uh, religious faith. Now, I'm not going to talk about historical, from a historical perspective, I'm not going to talk about uh, from a uh, sociological perspective, but from what I think of as a philosophical perspective about the relationship between science and religion. Um, now, religious believers, so I'm going to talk through six or seven slides. Um, re religious believers believe that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is what uh, people of the Jewish faith, Muslims, Christians, and many others as well believe. Now these people at the same time also believe such things as that iron expands when it gets heated. Now, is there a tension between believing the one and the other? Um, Christians and Muslims, they believe that God sustains the world from moment to moment. Uh, at the same time, insofar as these Christians or Muslims are scientists, they also believe um, that uh, light moves with a tremendous speed uh, from the light sources from which they uh, that, that propagate them. Is there any tension between these beliefs? Is there a warfare or can they go together? Well, these two examples I just give make it seems like, uh, like it's obviously the case that they can go together. How can these things that I've mentioned be in tension with one another? And as a matter of fact, I'll argue over the course of the next 30 minutes, that the warfare metaphor is really misguided. Um, and I'll be pointing to a couple of what I think of as limitations of science that leave enough for religious belief. I should say up front that I identify as a Christian. So most of my examples uh, or most of the reference that I'll be making uh, um, um, regard Christianity, but um, from other religious perspectives, um, 
things could be appropriated uh, that I've said as well. They hold for them as well. The first thing I'd like to point out is this. We do science, we engage in scientific activity in order to expand our knowledge. Now it is in my profession, an interesting question to ask, what is knowledge? What do we have when we have knowledge? What's required for having knowledge? Now there is a sort of simple starting point that we, that's enough for us to work with. The first thing to note is that if you are to know something, also if you are to know something scientifically, then it's at the very least required that you believe that thing. Let me give an ordinary day example. Um, you cannot know that the earth revolves around its axis and yet not believe that the earth revolves around its axis. It would, it's silly, it's strange, it's inappropriate to say, well, I know that the earth revolves around its axis, but by the way, I don't believe it. Now, this suggests that in order to know something, you at the very least would, must believe it. But merely believing something to be the case isn't enough for knowing it to be the case. If I merely believe, or if I believe that the, that the earth revolves around its axis, that as such is insufficient for my knowing it. For, and that's the second thing um, that I'd like to uh, draw attention to, a belief, if it is to qualify as knowledge, should be true. So if I believe that the earth revolves around its axis, and I want my belief to be an, an instance of knowing, then it should be true that the earth revolves around its axis. And this is one reason why no one could ever know something like this. No one could ever know that uh, Paris is the capital of the Netherlands. That could not be known because it just isn't so. It isn't a fact. It's only fact that can be known. So if I, if someone is to know that the earth revolves around the axis or is to know any other scientific proposition, then that person should believe it and it should moreover be true. But that's not enough. There's a third condition that must be satisfied. You should also have, if you want to know something, you should have a reason or a basis for what you believe. So if I, let's say, if I believe that there is extraterrestrial life, and suppose it's even true that there is extraterrestrial life, but I have no evidence whatsoever for it, then my belief, even though it's true, it isn't an instance of knowledge. Here's, here's a further example to, um, to indicate, the, uh, to illustrate the same point. Suppose I participate in a, in a lottery and I buy a ticket and I look at the ticket in my hand and I come to believe this is the winning ticket. And in fact, it turns out to be the winning ticket, but I have no evidence whatsoever for it. I have no reason whatsoever to believe it. Then on the analysis of knowledge that I'm now discussing, this wouldn't be an instance of knowing. I wouldn't be in that situation. I wouldn't be knowing that the winning, that the ticket that I hold in my hand is the winning ticket. So what's required for knowledge is that you believe something to be the case. It must be true what you believe to be the case. And thirdly, your belief must be warranted or it must have a basis. It should be evidenced. It should have an evidential basis. Now, if you look at this first bullet, then it seems that, well, we know these conditions, they seem very often uh, satisfied. For instance, I know that I'm currently uh, in my home village, which is Bambrugge, which is near Amsterdam. I know this because I believe it, it's true. And furthermore, I have a lot of warrant for that. So I know that I'm currently in Bambrugge. Uh, and I also know that promises I make ought to be kept by me. I know this because I believe it. And moreover, it's true. And thirdly, I have a lot of warrant for it. I've got a lot of reason for thinking that. Now, as I indicated the second bullet, the warrant condition can be satisfied through scientific inquiry of some form. It may be science that indicates that the belief that you hold and that the, uh, that the belief that you hold uh, is warranted. 
science may give us a lot of reasons for believing that certain propositions, certain theories are true. Um, so the third condition, the third knowledge condition could be satisfied through something that, um, uh, that qualifies as scientific investigation or scientific inquiry. So this account of knowledge that I'm now working with, that I'm now trying to introduce to you, says there is such a thing as scientific knowledge. And the hallmark of scientific knowledge is that it is knowledge for which it's true that the third condition, what I call the triple I, that condition is satisfied through scientific investigation. But we should also note that the third condition could also be satisfied in many other ways than through scientific in, uh, inquiry. Certain things that we know, uh, we know not on the basis of scientific investigation, but in some other way. For instance, I know that my name is René van Woudenburg, and I know that I'm a professor of philosophy at the Free University. Well, I don't know these things in a way that is in any way based on scientific investigation. It would be very strange to say a thing like that. I haven't done science. I haven't done scholarly research in what my aim is or what my position is. And likewise, you too, um, where in the world you're uh, attending to this uh, talk, there are many things that you know for which it's true that the third condition for knowledge isn't satisfied by scientific research, but in, uh, in other ways. To expand a bit on, on it, if we know, and if I know, that I ought to keep the promises that I've made, then the warrant condition there is not satisfied by anything uh, that qualifies uh, as scientific research. Uh, I know it uh, in other ways. The evidence for that is very different from the sort of evidence that I do need if my belief, for instance, that the world revolves around its axis, uh, is to be warranted or justified. So warrants can, can, can come from science, but it can also come from elsewhere. It can come from perception. I now know that I'm looking at my computer screen well, I know this, it's true. I, I'm sorry, I believe this, it's true. And I have a lot of warrant for it, but the warrant is not scientific investigation. Uh, still, it is warranted. And my warrant here comes from perception. I can go into much greater detail in all these things, but I'm not gonna do that. I also know that I lived in the United States for a couple of years. I believe this to be the case, it was the case, uh, but, the warrant condition, the third condition, isn't satisfied by scientific investigation. At this moment, it's uh, uh, satisfied by my clearly remembering that I live there. So we can know things through science, but there are also a lot of things we can know in ways um, that bypass the science or that are non-scientific. Now, here's an interesting question. Is everything that we do know, can it also be known in a way that involves scientific research? Now, I suppose that some of the things that we do know in a non-scientific way could also be known through science. For instance, I know that my great-grandfather was a shipbuilder in the harbor of Rotterdam. I haven't done any historical research into that, but it was just a family, family testimonial chain that reached me on the basis of which I, I now believe this. But of course, I could have, if I find, found the time for it or interesting enough that I could spare, spend uh, time and money on it to figure that out. And then perhaps I could say, well, now my knowing that my great grandfather was a shipbuilder is scientific knowledge or is scholarly based knowledge. Uh, so for some of the things that we know in a non-scientific way, it is possible to also know it in a scientific way through something that qualifies as scientific research. But we shouldn't assume that it's always the case. So when we think we know that we ought to keep our promises or that honesty is much better than dishonesty, or if we know any other moral, moral proposition, moral truth, we shouldn't think that science could also tell us the same thing. We shouldn't assume that physicists or biologists or um, or perhaps 
economists, economists will be able to tell us that. Uh, still, we do know these moral things. That's what I call irreducibly extra scientific knowledge. Now, something that I said, something similar to what I said about uh, moral knowledge may also hold for religious knowledge or religious belief or religion more generally. It may be the case that we are capable of knowing things even though the warrant condition is not satisfied by scientific investigation. That's nothing against science, but it is a reminder that there are so many different sources of evidence, so many grounds for believing things other than science uh, that sometimes uh, tends to be uh, forgotten. Um, it's especially uh, in philosophical circles, uh, a view that's called scientism, which in fact denies that there are these extra scientific sources uh, of, uh, of evidence. Well, this is my first point. There is a limitation from extra scientific knowledge. Science is limited in that it can only give us scientific knowledge, which is great, which is fantastic, which we are profiting from on a day-to-day -day basis. But still, we shouldn't think that the whole of what we are capable of knowing is what, what can be known by us through scientific investigation. And now move on to a second limitation of, um, that is inherent in scientific inquiry. We know many things that um, we know many things through experience. For instance, I know the taste of beer, I know the taste of water, I know how certain roses smell, uh, I know how certain textures of surfaces, how they feel. We know these things. Now, very often, this sort of knowledge is called knowledge by acquaintance. We are all, it's, it's being familiar with things, familiar with sounds, familiar with shapes, familiar, we're familiar with colors and the like. Um, now, and if you think of it, we know these things, it's called often knowledge by acquaintance, um, but that's just not the sort of knowledge that science can give us. If science can tell us that um, grass looks green because of certain um, physical processes uh, that are going on, um, in regard of the perception of grasses. But what it is like to see something green, that's not the sort of thing that science can tell us. Now there is a, there is a wonderful thought experiment that was um, written up uh, some decades ago by the Australian philosopher, Frank Jackson, and it's called What Mary Couldn't Have Known. Now the story goes like this, Mary is a, uh, is a very intelligent woman, and she is raised under very strange circumstances. She was uh, raised in a fully black and white environment. So everything that she sees is either black or white. Her parents um, either wore black or white uh, clothes. Uh, the walls were painted white or black. And she, when she comes of age, she is instructed through a television screen, black and white television screen. As I said, Mary is supposed to be very intelligent and she's really interested in physics and especially in the physics of color perception. Now she, she, she takes classes with Harvard uh, professors who are the experts in the field uh, of perception. And so she knows all that's going on uh, when people are perceiving things. But in fact, she never saw anything blue she didn't never, she, ne she never saw anything red or green. So here's the question. If Mary specializes in the physics of perception, does she know everything there is to know? And if we suppose that, that the physics of perception uh, is, has reached its final stage, there's nothing more that can be known about physics of perception then that's what's known by the Harvard professors and that what's being and what they have taught to Mary. Does she know everything there is to know about perception? Well, the intuition that many 
to also but have is no, there is still something that she doesn't know. For the moment she gets released from her black and white environment, she comes to know something that she didn't know before. She comes to know what it is like for grass to be green. She comes to know what it is for the sky to be blue or to be overcast or uh, gray or anything of the sort. Now, what, is, what this thought experiment is supposed to show is that there is more to know than just propositional truths. There are things that, we, that can be known uh, that just are not truths. And now for a, from a religious perspective, this is a very important thing because living a religious life involves many more things than assenting to propositions. As a Christian, I subscribe to the tenets of the Christian faith. I accept the, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I, I believe that God is the creator of the heaven and the earth. I believe that Christ is the son of God and many other things. These are things that I believe. These are true things. I believe them to be true. I hold them to be true. At the same time, religious belief isn't only uh, assenting to proposition, propositions. Religious faith involves an element of acquaintance, of acquaintance. There is such a thing as being acquainted with God or being acquainted with the Lord. Uh, many of the religious uh, uh, traditions outside of Christianity also talk about that. It's being engaged with God. It's being taken on by God. It's being in a way um, being in the possession of some knowledge by acquaintance of God. And if what Christianity says here is true, then every person in the world is in some way or other acquainted with God. Now, this sort of knowledge by acquaintance is something that science cannot give. Science gives us propositional knowledge of important sorts, but also of limited sorts, as I've indicated on the previous slide. So here's a second limitation uh, for science. It can give us knowledge of truths. It can give us propositional knowledge, as we usually call it, but it cannot give us knowledge by acquaintance. And that's for many religious traditions, a very important fact. And there is space enough for this knowledge by acquaintance left over by, uh, by, by science. My next point is this. There is a limitation for science in that science proceeds from presuppositions that, it cannot, that science itself cannot prove to be true. Think, for instance, of the principles of logic. We accept some principles of logic, most exponents, right? That's such a principle. Or that's the principle that says if if proposition P entails proposition Q and P is the case, then so Q will be the case. Or if P, then Q. And if P is true, then it follows that Q must be true as well. And there are uh, lots of other principles of logic that we use when we argue in science. Another thing that we are assuming when we uh, engage in scientific work is that we that our basic faculties are reliable. So we use our faculties of perception, our faculty of reason, we trust our memory, uh, we, uh, we trust each other when we uh, engage in science. Um, so there's a lot of basic trust in our faculties when we are pursuing science. That's a presupposition of science. If our faculties were to be deemed totally untrustworthy, then science just could not get off the ground. Then we, would know, then we wouldn't have any reason whatsoever to believe that science can put us on the path towards truth. Towards truth. There's a third uh, presupposition of science uh, that we work with, namely that science behaves in a uniform way. What happens here and now is in a way uniform to what happens to what happened in the past. 
or what happens here is uh, in uh, important ways um, of the same kind as what happens elsewhere. Uh, water uh, not only uh, boils under normal circumstances uh, at uh, temperatures above 100 degrees Celsius, but it, also, it, did, it did so uh, in the past. It will so do in the future. It does in the Netherlands, but so it does in the UK or in Germany or in Egypt. Nature behaves uniform. We may not know prior to research what the uniformities of nature are. That's why we do scientific research because we want to get to know them. But the assumption is nature behaves uniform. Now, if something is a presupposition uh, of the practice of science, then this means the following. You cannot sensibly engage in the practice of doing science and yet deny that presupposition. You cannot sensibly deny that there are these principles of logic or that are, you cannot deny that our basic faculties are reliable or you cannot deny that the nature, nature behaves uniform. You cannot deny it and still in a coherent way engage in the practice of scientific research. Now these things are presupposed. We cannot do science unless, unless we accept them. Now what this short exercise about presuppositions of science um, shows, I think, is this. It is not irrational to accept things that are not established by science because science itself is based on things that are not established by science itself because they are presupposed by it. Now, very often in my circles and, and a lot of my students um, uh, come up with this, uh, with this matter uh, in, in the classes that I, or some of the classes that I teach, they say, well, if religious belief isn't based on science, then how can we possibly take it to be true? And in the discussion of such a in, in the context of such a discussion, I make this point while well, science presupposes many things that science itself cannot prove either. So that is an obvious li limitation uh, uh, to science, nothing against it, but it cannot be used uh, as a weapon against uh, religious belief uh, either. Moreover, many of the things that I mentioned, so that our basic faculties are reliable, that nature behaves uniform, those, those convictions, those presuppositions of science, as a matter of fact, match very well with, certainly with Christian, uh, with Christian belief. Um, our basic faculties are reliable, we can trust them to not mislead us in the most fundamental uh, ways, well, that's, that fits the picture that Christians have of God as being reliable, being trustworthy. Uh, he wouldn't endow us with faculties uh, that would systematically be misleading. Um, and also that nature behaves uniform, uh, that God, as Christians believe, rules the world. He oversees the world. Um, he is orchestrating uh, the things that are happening. There is a pattern to God's behavior, and that's why in uh, that's that's an important that's why that's why it is an important thought in the Christian tradition that the laws of nature are in a way the ground rules by means of which or along which God uh, operates in the world or rules the world. Um, now these presuppositions don't match so well with naturalism, which is the, which is the view that there, that there is no God, that there is no um, divine person overseeing things. I'm not going into that, but if in the Q&A questions come up, I can um, go into that as well. There's a further limitation to science that I'd like to shortly mentioned that is a, what I call a limit from ultimate questions. So apart from um, really interesting scientific questions, there are all sorts of other questions 
that are meaningful, uh, but the answers to which cannot be given or don't seem to be given uh, by what we nowadays call scientific research. So I have in mind questions about what makes our lives valuable, what gives substance or ferment to our lives, what makes it, what makes our lives valuable, meaning, what is the meaning of our existence? Uh, are we just here for no good reason, or is there something um, behind it all? Um, are we called? to do certain things, or are we called upon to lead lives, our lives in a very specific way? Well, these are questions that are meaningful questions. We may not be very good at answering them, um, but it is clear that science just doesn't seem to be capable of answering these questions. What gives value to my life? What gives value to your life? Well, is science gonna tell us that? I don't think so. Now, at one time, not so long time ago, uh, there was a, an, an, an important group of really brilliant philosophers um, who were, had a home base in Vienna, in Austria. They were called, later on, the neo-positivists, and they held on to what they called the verification principle. Um, and that principle meant, among other things, that if a question cannot be answered by science, it's a meaningless question. Uh, if science cannot answer a question, there must be something wrong with the question. So here was one, one example that they, that they sometimes gave of a meaningless question. So here's a meaningless, meaningless question. Where does my lap go when I stand up? Well, it just doesn't make sense to, that, that question doesn't make sense and hence trying to answer it would be futile. And the same holds for questions like, uh, how, what was the weight of the dream that you had last night? Well, just saying, it just makes no sense to say, well, it was a pound or two and a half kilograms or whatever. Um, the, and now what the neo-positivist held was that moral questions, but also religious questions, they are questions that with which that's, there's something wrong. They are ill put. There's something wrong with them of the, same, of the same kind that's wrong with the question, where does my lap go when I stand up or what's the, what's the weight of your dream? So they placed in a way an intellectual then on asking these ultimate questions about meaning, about value. I think here we see um, some sort of a limitation of science. Science isn't in the business or cannot be in the business to answer these, ult the ultimate, these ultimate questions about value, about meaning, uh, about these, these why questions. Why are we here? Uh, is, there, do, is there a job we have to do or, 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 or those questions? Now, I do think these are important questions. We, do need to take them seriously. Many people take them seriously, but perhaps science just is not the right place to look at when we want to answer them. The religious traditions, and the one that I know best, the Christian tradition, will say, well, many of these questions are addressed through divine revelation. Through me to many of these questions, God has revealed answers. So what is the meaning of life? Well, the meaning of life, according to the one classical Christian answer, is the meaning of life is to be in communication, in communion with God. Um, what gives value to human lives? Well, what gives value to human lives, according to the Christian revelation, is to be in communion with God and to do those things vis-a-vis -vis others and for others that God asks us uh, to do for them. So ultimate questions, science cannot answer them. They're still good questions. There's this one reality we ask questions about. Science, ans science answers some questions and religion, which is another discipline, answers 
some of those other questions. Uh, there is no conflict here. Uh, they're addressing, to a, to a large extent, different questions. Uh, and they are uh, answering these questions on a different evidential basis, scientific uh, evidential basis. And in the case of Christianity, um, sources like Revelation, but there is more. The final slide I'd like to put is this one. Um, it's all, it, it is related to the previous point that I've been making. In science, we try to explain things, among other things, we try to explain them. Now, at one point, uh, when, we, when we explain, we have to stop. Um, why? For this reason. I'm now going to I'm now going to paint a very simple picture of what it is to uh, offer a scientific explanation uh, of, of a phenomenon. Usually, or when we try to explain something, we, we usually refer to a general law. So when we want to explain why water in an open container evaporates, we make reference to uh, relevant laws. Uh, some of the laws have, have to do with the, with the surface tension on the water, but it also, uh, other laws have to do with um, the movement with which, with which the water molecules um, move. Uh, it, um, certain other laws have to do with the forces that work uh, among molecules. When we try to explain why water in an open container evaporates, we make a reference to those laws. And we say, well, you know, here in these specific uh, initial conditions of this water, uh, this container holding a, a little bit of water, uh, those were the specific, specific conditions. And given that, plus the general laws, we explain why the water, why water uh, evaporates. Now, can we explain can we explain the laws themselves? Well, some laws presumably can be, or as a matter of fact, can be uh, explained by higher order laws. But we cannot go on explaining higher order laws by ever higher or, or order laws. There must be some laws that are just there. They define the kind of explanation that I've been trying to paint. Now you might think, well, there is a scientific, there are scientific explanations, but these scientific explanations refer to laws and some of those laws may be scientifically explainable uh, themselves, but there is an end to it. You might think that's a brute fact. The basic laws of physics, the basic laws that govern the physical cosmos, they are just inexplicable brute facts. They are just there. But, you might also think, well, there is this type of scientific explanation that makes a reference to laws, but there's also another kind of explanation that, that provides genuine insight uh, in the world, that provides, um, provides genuine understanding of what's going on, but just doesn't have that character. It is the kind of explanations that uh, the kind of explanation that's going on when I find on my desk the book that I hadn't put there myself, but my wife tells me, "Well, the book is there because uh, Victor, our son, wants you to read it, and he wants to have you wants wants to have your own opinion on it." Here I here I explain the presence of the book on my desk, not by reference to a law, but by reference to the intentions of an agent, a person, in this case, my son, Victor. Uh, that's how I explain the presence of the book on my desk. And when you think of it, many things that are in our direct environments are things that we, the existence of which we explain by reference to uh, agents who have intentions. If you try to explain the existence of cars, 
or computers or books or many other things, you have to make a reference to intentions that people had. Now, now I come up to now I come up to the final point. Science gives explanations of things, but it leaves also things unexplained, certain brute facts. And uh, the fundamental laws of physics may be among those brute facts. Well, it is possible. It may not be required, but it is possible to give a personal explanation of those, of the existence of those uh, most basic laws. And the person referred to in a personal explanation of obviously it cannot be a human person. Uh, it will have to be a divine person. The point, general point I'm trying to make is this. Even if science explains things, that doesn't make it impossible for God to also play an explanatory role at another level. If science explains things, that doesn't mean that there is no place for God in a world um, that is to a high degree scientifically uh, explainable. So there's one world, we try to get to know it. Uh, we want to know aspects of it, but science and religion, they give us different angles on the same world. They draw on different sources of evidence. They tell us different things, they have different purposes, but they go together well. We cannot always see it clearly sometimes you really have to think hard about um, about some cases, uh, but my conviction is it can be done. Um, and over the course of this, I'm sure you will see um, a number of examples in which you that, that, that illustrate the general point that I've been trying to make. So thank you very much. And I'm eager to hear questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rene, very much for uh, a very helpful talk. Uh, a number of questions have come in in the question answer box. And so um, I'm just going to select one or two, uh, particularly ones where a similar theme comes up. And so the first question I'd like to ask you is one about our perceptions. You, is it not dangerous to confirm your warrant through perception and memory? Because these are sometimes flawed, as in the case of an extremist or a story that's lost its meaning through repetition. Right. Um, that is a that that is an that is an uh, uh, an excellent question. So, I've we we should acknowledge that our faculties they are not foolproof. Uh, we do make mistakes. Uh, at the same time, we also think that the faculties that we are using um, don't entirely uh, um, lead us on false tracks. Um, so even if we misperceive things occasionally, by taking a better look, we may get uh, a more adequate uh, view of what we're, what we're looking at. So when the lightning conditions uh, are, are not so good, uh, well, th or that's the reason why if the lightning conditions aren't so good, we should be cautious in forming um, very specific beliefs, for instance, about, about the colors of things or about the distances of things. Um, our memories can fail us. On the other hand, um, we can also by trying our best to get a more correct uh, memory of what was going on. But I should, we should acknowledge upfront that none of our faculties is foolproof. But the point that I was needing for my argument or the, 
um, and what I think we are needing when we are doing science, and also when we, when we are trying to think about a relation between science and religion is that our faculties are not systematically misleading us. Uh, it is possible under certain conditions that our visual perception is misleading, that our memories are misleading. Uh, also our, 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 our rational faculties, our reason may, may mislead us, but not systematically. We, we assume that it's in principle possible to actually get to know where we made our mistakes. But Rene, there's another question which comes in on the same theme, that picking up the Christian position argues that the Christian, Christian teaching says that we are misled, we are blinded, our faculties are not necessarily reliable, um, because as um, humans we miss the point so often. So how does that fit into what you've just said? Yeah, yeah, so... So in the Christian tradition, there has been an um, uh, important discussion about what, what's called the noetic effects of sin. So how sin influences um, our, our, our faculties. Um, now, I think we should make a distinction here. Sure, there is sin. And sin has, sin impacts uh, our, our cognitive labors. At the same time, there's also finitude. So when God created human beings, he didn't create them as omniscient. Uh, he didn't create them with faculties that are able to know all there is to know. So in the Christian tradition, uh, God is believed to be, to be all-knowing. Well, human beings are not all-knowing. Uh, all so that has to do with finitude. Um, so some of the things that we don't know may not have to do with sin, but they simply may have to do with finitude at the same time. Um, uh, there, is, there is the noetic influence of sin, but if we read St. Paul uh, in the New Testament, then it seems that, the, that, that, that when we are misremembering, for instance, uh, certain facts in the past, you know, I, when, when I misremember my first telephone number that I ever had, well, that's not a noetic, noetic effect of sin that has to do with my finitude. But when St. Paul talks about noetic effects of sin, he says, well, our relationship to God and our knowledge of God, especially, and the knowledge that's um, that's in the same that's in the vicinity like what our duties are uh, well there their sin wreaks havoc uh, uh, very often so yeah we're fallible because we are finite and because we are sinful um, but that's different from saying that that nothing we believe can be trusted because our faculties are systematically misleading us. Okay, thank you. Let me let me take you to a different subject area. Um, there's a question here which talks about the whole area of the ultimate questions that we ask, and we tend to categorize them as religious questions. Is that correct? Are there non-religious and non-scientific ways of knowing? Um, that also deal with ultimate questions. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm inclined to think the the ultimate questions they they do have this this religious feeling uh, to them this religious uh, uh, aspect. Um, so I suppose. So there was, so, so when, I, when I wrote my, my PhD dissertation many years back, uh, I was involved with a couple of German philosophers. And one of them said, well, we cannot explain why we see that two equals two. There's no deeper, there's no deep explanation for it. We cannot explain it. At the same time, this is truly mysterious. 
as a matter of fact, in, in the German language, he said, there is etwas numinoses daran. Um, and I do think that when we, when we get to the more foundational things, these, these, these ultimate questions, yeah, they, they have this religious sense of wonder that comes with those, with those questions. Yeah, I'm, at the same time, I would be interested in, uh, in examples of questions that, um, that are ultimate, um, but wouldn't be deemed or shouldn't be deemed as religious questions. I'm, I, I would be interested in those. Okay, um, let me take you to yet another area. Um, when we talk about scientific laws, are these real? Or are these a construct of doing science? Is there such a thing really as a scientific law? Yeah. Um, so this is a deep philosophical, a deep philosophical question. So ever since uh, Immanuel Kant, um, there has been this this idea that that law that the laws of nature or what we call laws of nature are are human projections uh, onto the world of experience. Um, so Kant, Kant himself, for instance, thought that we th he, he thought that we cannot think otherwise. Uh, about the physical world as in terms of causal relationships, right? We think that the, the heating of the stone was caused by the shining of the sun or the breaking of the window was caused by the, the throwing of the ball. But he says the world as it is in itself doesn't display these causal relationships. It's us that puts those causal structures onto what we perceive. We don't, we don't see them. Um, um, this is usually called uh, anti-realism uh, in, in, uh, in the philosophy of science. Um, so to me it seems that when it comes, well, I, I must say, um, to me the realist perspective just seems to be the right one. Um, what's up to us is the concepts that we use, but what's not up to us is what it is that we apply those concepts to. So we have a lot of space and a lot of freedom in conceptualizing things, but once, but what it is that we, uh, that we use the concepts for to discuss, that's not up to us, that's, those, are, those are given to us. So I'm, I'm, I tend to be a realist about uh, the laws of nature, which is not to say that I'm a realist about, or, 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 or which is not to deny that certain laws of physics that the form, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to say something simple, but now I make it more <laughs> complicated than it is. Some of the formulations of, of laws of nature, those are fallible. Uh, but whatever these laws that we formulate are supposed to be about, I, I think that's, that exists mostly independently of us. So here I, I tend to, or here I side with the, with the, with the realists uh, on, on laws of nature. Okay, thank you. Um, how about this? Um, do you think that there is a hierarchy of knowledge? Does one path of knowledge supersede another? If so, how do we create a hierarchy of knowledge? Yeah, right. Um, it, it seems entirely intuitive that there is some sort of a hierarchy. So if I, if I now know, because I just see it happening, that a bird flies uh, past my window of my study, well, that isn't, that isn't relevant knowledge, that isn't deep knowledge. It's still something that I know. Um, so there is, there is the knowledge of trivia. Um, and, and I think that we should do our best to know the things that, that matter, which means that we surely should try to get to know 
uh, whether there is a God. We should, that's really important. We should try to get to know our obligations. So how should we live? What, what should we do? And what definitely, what, what should we not do? Uh, that's uh, as important as well. Uh, that's much more important than some than many other things that we are capable of knowing. But of course, uh, it's always very situational. Uh, what is it, what is important? So just in the abstract to say this is much more important than that. Well, if you're if you're a conductor, or if you're a scientist, or if you if you are. A, uh, a, a high school or an elementary school teacher, then different things are um, uh, the most important things for you to know. But still, through all uh, throughout all this, I, I I do think that knowing God, knowing our duties, knowing our obligations, those are up there for everyone. But what they are, especially in the case of, of duties. That of course differs between people according to their walks of life and their professions.